In this module number 15, we're going to talk about some folks that were exceptionally successful in business 2,000 years ago. For you see, in the Roman Empire, the Romans discovered they loved gold. They loved money. And they can trade overseas. They sent ships to the United Kingdom, Great Britain, looking for tin. Tin to add to copper tend to make bronze. They love sailing to Phoenicia to get oranges and into the cedars of Lebanon to get that special wood. They traveled all over the world looking for gold. Now, how did they make more gold? Well, you see, the masters would take their most trusted slaves and say, look, you take the ship, you sail and look for me for goods. And this slave actually became the agent for the master in looking for gold. So right now, we're going to take a look at the law of agency, the law set up so that the master can make more money. All right, please. Department 1 of the Orange County Court is now in session. The Honorable Russell A. Boston is the judge presiding. Your Honor, we feel that the plaintiff in this case has utterly failed to establish the necessary grounds on which it would be entitled to judgment. We think there are two basic reasons for this. First Counsel, of all, do you have any other witnesses or evidence you wish to produce at this time? An agency relationship is a relationship between two parties, an agent and a principal. The agent and the principal have certain rights and duties, but there's more to an agency relationship than just the rights and responsibilities of the two parties involved in it. There are also rights of third persons who deal with agents. In any agency relationship, there are two specific areas that affect third parties. The first area concerns the rights of third parties when they contract with agents, and in turn, the liability of the agent, the principal, and the third party for the proper performance of these contracts. The second area is the agent's liability to third parties in the case of wrongs or torts committed by that agent, and as a result, the principal's liability to the third party due to an agent's torts. Let's examine the first area, the rights and liabilities of the agent, the principal, and the third party for the proper performance of contracts. A principal will not be liable for every act committed by his or her agent, or for every contract signed by that agent. The liability might turn out to be the agent's rather than the principal's. To determine which one is liable in a contract with a third party, the court will look at the authority given to the agent to enter legally binding contracts on the principal's behalf. Specifically, the court will examine two main issues. First, did the principal authorize the agent to enter the contract, either by actual authority, by appearing to give authority, or by ratifying the act of the agent? And second, to what degree was the third party aware of the fact that the agent was representing a principal? In other words, was the principal a disclosed principal, an undisclosed principal, or a partially disclosed principal? The key issue the court will consider is whether the agent was authorized to enter this type of contract. This is more complicated than it sounds, because authority can be established in a number of different ways. There are seven different ways of establishing authority. Express authority occurs when the principal tells the agent that he or she has the authority to engage in a specific act or do a specific task. 
Express authority okay, can be given right. orally. For example, what when a client say? tells an antique broker, you can look into purchase right an now. antique chair for me, as long as you don't spend okay. more than $400. Express authority can also be given in writing, such as when a principal gives an agent a written power of attorney. Incidental authority occurs in order to enable the agent to complete his or her assigned duties. This type of authority arises when it is reasonable and necessary for the performance of those duties. Take, for example, a sales manager working for a large multinational corporation. The manager has the responsibility for millions of dollars in sales. But nobody could reasonably expect this individual to deal personally with all of the corporation's customers. And so the manager has the incidental authority to hire and fire salespeople. Implied authority is based on the agent's position or on custom. In other words, on past dealings between the agent and the third party. If the agent is given a title and a position, then that implies that the agent can enter into the same type of contracts that people with this title normally can. Suppose, for example, a manager is hired to run a retail store, and the manager's authority to enter into purchasing contracts has not been expressly stated. Nevertheless, the manager has that implied authority, because that is what someone in this position would normally do. Implied authority can also exist because of custom or similar dealings in the past between the agent and the third party. If the principal did not object to such past dealings, it is assumed those dealings were authorized, and therefore that the current contracts are authorized as well. Apparent authority occurs when the principal creates the appearance that an agency relationship exists, or that the agent has broader powers than he or she actually has, and the third party has reasonably relied on that representation. Oh, you ready? Here, the representation by the principal is made to the third party rather than to the agent. It's about time. Apparent authority is based on conduct of the principal, conduct which causes a reasonable third party to believe that a particular person is authorized to act as the principal's agent. That conduct can consist of either word or action. Emergency authority is inherent in all agency relationships. It does not have to be expressed. It provides the agent with the authority to respond to emergencies going beyond the agent's normal ability to bind the principal, even though the principal and the agent have never discussed the type of emergency or how to respond to it. Let's look at how emergency authority would work when an emergency occurs in a condominium. The one thing we know for sure about this type of emergency is that it will probably obey Murphy's Law. That is, it will probably happen when the owner is out of town. And that is precisely what occurred several months ago in the posh townhouse of Meg and Eric Detweiler. No sooner had Meg's younger sister Cynthia taken up her duties as house sitter in residence than a pipe burst flooding the immediate area and threatening to create a domestic disaster of major proportion. Hi. Yeah, when they returned from their vacation, Meg and Eric Detweiler had a bill waiting for them because the house sitter, Meg's sister Cynthia, had emergency authority to authorize that the repairs be made in her role as house sitter. Authority by estoppel occurs when the principal allows someone to pass him or herself off as an agent and takes no steps to prevent the supposed agent's representation. This type of authority prevents a principal who has misled a third party from denying the agent's authority. For example, not long ago, Mitch Karpinski and David Southworth were chatting about Southworth's boat and how he might want to sell it. Karpinski mentioned a party they were both planning on attending and volunteered that he would try to find a buyer among the guests. Southworth laughed the idea off at the time, but it turned out Karpinski took the matter very seriously. Once at the party, he became something of a non-stop selling machine, subjecting everyone he met to the same maritime sales pitch. Southworth saw this taking place but still refused to take it seriously and did nothing to put a stop to it. Finally, however, Karpinski managed to convince one of the party guests to buy the boat, but at a price that was considerably lower than what Southworth thought was fair. At this point, 
Southworth finally decided to get involved. Unfortunately, his decision came too late, and he was forced to accept the price Karpinski had negotiated. In this case, the innocent buyer was protected because Karpinski was, in fact, an agent who had authority by estoppel. The last way authority can be created is by ratification. It occurs when the agent does something that was unauthorized at the time, and the principal approves it later. Suppose, for example, that a tenant who is not permitted to authorize repairs contracts to have repair work done on a rented house that he or she lives in. In this case, the tenant is the agent and the owner of the house is the principal. If the principal sees the paperwork detailing the repairs and their cost and tells the agent to go ahead with the work, then the repair contract would be ratified by the principal's express statement. Or if the principal sees the repair people actually setting up to make the repairs and fails to object or repudiate them within a reasonable time, the contract would also be ratified. There are two critical points to remember when we analyze these various methods of establishing authority. First, for a third party to recover a judgment, all that needs to be proved is that one type of authority exists. Second, even in cases when the agent does not actually have authority, if the third person reasonably believes that such authority exists because of circumstances that the principal has created or allowed to exist, then the principal will have to honor the contract. Usually, a person who is dealing with an agent is aware of the agency relationship and knows who the agent represents. But this is not always the case. Depending on the extent of the third party's knowledge, Principles are classified as disclosed, partially disclosed, or undisclosed. So what we need to know is precisely what each of these terms means and how each affects the liability of the principal and the agent. A disclosed principal is a principal whose identity is fully made known to a party or parties who are dealing with an agent of that principal so that the party who is negotiating a contract with the agent realizes that he's not dealing directly with that agent, that the contract will in effect be with the principal. The agent is merely acting on behalf of uh, someone whose identity is clearly known to that other party. A sales agent for a corporation when he calls on a customer, he's going to present the customer with his card, with any brochures that he has from the company, the principal, on the product that he is selling, that he's demonstrating, that he's taking orders for. The card and the brochures will designate the principal. The third person knows where the product will originate, knows who will be responsible for delivery, setup, warranty, whatever. It's just, it's the standard practice of making the person aware Hi there, I represent so-and-so, I am his agent, and I'm here on his behalf to enter this contract. The agent impliedly promises that he or she has authority and that the principal has authorized the contract. The agent makes the promises to the third party without ever saying the words that they have authority or that the principal has authorized the transaction. They're part of every agency negotiation. So if I also, the agent something like this, warrants or implies that the principal the they are acting curves, for, in fact, exists, is confident and has the capacity to enter into the contract. And again, those promises are made without ever saying anything. It's part of the agent negotiations. When a principal is a disclosed principal, the liability of each of the three parties to the contract can be very specifically identified. When an agent yeah. enters into a contract for a disclosed principal and had the authority to enter into that contract for the disclosed principal, then the disclosed principal is liable to the third party on that contract and the contractual relationship is between the third party and the principal. The principal can hold the third party fully liable to the contract, can bring suit to enforce the contract. There are full contractual rights between those two. The agent, assuming that the agent act with full authority and entered into the transaction properly, does not have liability on the contract that it is the two other parties, the disclosed party and the third party, 
who will have the direct contractual relationship. As long as the agent did not exceed his authority, neither the principal nor the third have rights against the agent. Now, the principal and agent also have a contract. The principal has rights against the agent if the agent exceeds his authority. He may have a right to indemnification or to reimbursement or for breach of contract. If the agent exceeds his authority and it's not something where the principal is bound, if he goes beyond apparent authority, the third person has a right against the agent for breach of warranty. In most cases, the principal an agent represents is disclosed to the third party. But in some situations, there may be an undisclosed principal. In other words, one whose existence and identity are unknown to the third party. And while this isn't the norm, from time to time it does happen. In one such case, the PDQ company hired Dell Thomas as its agent to purchase some surplus computer hardware that Alphanumerics Incorporated was offering for sale. PDQ and Alphanumerics were both in the business of compiling and selling computerized databases. In other words, in the information business. In fact, PDQ and Alphanumerics were competitors. So naturally, PDQ was afraid that if Alphanumerics found out it was the principal in the deal, they would either increase their price or refuse to sell to them at all. After some negotiation, Dell Thomas was able to make a deal to buy the equipment from Alphanumerics. Thomas signed the contract in his own name, not indicating any agency relationship whatsoever. But when he delivered the hardware to PDQ, he discovered they'd found a better deal elsewhere on the same equipment, and they refused to pay him for it. And when he tried to return it to Alphanumerics, they too refused. A deal's a deal, they said. But of course, Alphanumerics still expected to get paid for their merchandise. The question is, who bears the liability in this situation? Is it PDQ, the principal, Dell Thomas, the agent, or alphanumerics, the third party. In other words, in the case of an undisclosed principle, what are the liabilities of the parties in a contract? The liabilities we are concerned about are those of Thomas and PDQ. What we have here is the case of an undisclosed principle, which is when the principle is not known to the third party. The key here is that Alphanumerics did not know that Thomas was acting as an agent for PDQ. Since Alphanumerics thought it was dealing with Thomas personally, of course Alphanumerics can hold Thomas personally liable for the contract price of the computer parts. At the same time, if Alphanumerics can show that PDQ authorized Thomas to buy these parts for PDQ, then Alphanumerics could also seek payment at the contract price from PDQ. This could be a real benefit to alphanumerics because it has now two parties it could seek to hold liable for the contract price. Of course, it cannot recover more than the contract price from both uh, PDQ and Thomas. To the extent that Thomas is liable to make payments for the computer parts, then he in turn can sue PDQ for violation of the agency relationship. But if for any reason Thomas cannot recover from PDQ, for example, PDQ is, is bankrupt or cannot be located, then Thomas is stuck paying for the computer equipment. All of which shows the very precarious position of an agent who deals for an undisclosed principal. There's one final type of principle that affects liability in an agency relationship. It's called a partially disclosed principle. A partially disclosed principle is one where the existence of the principle is known, but the principle's identity is not. As an example, take the case of C. William Stanford, one of the nation's wealthiest industrial real estate magnates, and Gary Milgram, a commercial real estate broker. Stanford hired Milgram to buy property for him, but not just any property, and not just a single piece of property. Mr. Stanford told me he basically wanted to corner as big a share of the choice commercial real estate market in this city as he possibly could. Uh, I immediately pointed out to him that a lot of people probably wouldn't want to sell if they knew who the buyer was. Uh, first of all, because he has a real reputation as a very tough and astute businessman, and second, because of how much he wanted to buy. Uh, I think a lot of people would, would basically be kind of jealous, I guess you'd say, that there was this guy coming in and kind of taking over. But Mr. Stanford was extremely persistent. Uh, I guess you don't get to where he is without knowing what you want and then going after it. 
And believe Great. me, he definitely knows what he wants. Thank you very much. So sir. we entered into a written agreement for me to act basically as his agent. It took some time, but C. William Stanford once again got what he wanted. His agent, Gary Milgram, presented himself to several property owners and politely informed each of them that he represented an investor who might be interested in purchasing their property. He was careful not to mention this investor by name, since he knew that doing so would reveal Stanford's plans and would undoubtedly alienate many of the property owners Stanford wished to buy out. The centerpiece in Stanford's grand scheme was an enormous hotel, a structure so impressive that any self-respecting real estate raider would want to call it his own. Stanford decided that he would go after this choice acquisition first and then build the rest of his empire around it. After several weeks of intense negotiations, Milgram was finally able to close the deal for the hotel and when the contract was drawn up, Milgram proudly signed it as Gary Milgram, agent. It was undoubtedly the crowning achievement of my career, my most prestigious purchase, not to mention my largest commission. But uh, I guess I should have known it was too good to last. When escrow was about to close, Mr. Stanford casually informed me that he had decided he didn't want the hotel after all, that he had decided to buy a professional baseball team of all things instead. The fact that Stanford was reneging on his contract didn't stop the hotel owners from demanding a large settlement. The key question, of course, is who is liable for that payment in this case? And in general, when there is a partially disclosed principle, what are the liabilities of the parties? We have to consider the liabilities both of the principal and the agent. With respect to the liability of Stanford, the partially disclosed principal, it was clear all along to the hotel people that Milgram was negotiating on behalf of someone else. Once the hotel people find out that that someone else was Stanford, Stanford is personally liable for any damages caused by his breach of contract. But what about the responsibility of Milgram, the agent, in this situation? Milgram is in essentially the same position as if he were an agent for an undisclosed principal. That is, Milgram can be held liable for Stanford's breach. The hotel owners were relying on the credibility, the reputation of Milgram, not Stanford, whose identity was unknown to them. Now, of course, Milgram can go after Stanford for recovery in the event that he is held liable for that breach. Even though Milgram may have some rights against Stanford, it's clearly in his best interest, once a problem develops, to disclose Stanford's identity as quickly as possible. Milgram would hope that once the hotel people find out that Stanford is the principal, uh, they'll go after Stanford and forget all about Milgram. Even if the hotel owners do go after Stanford, they still have the right to go after Milgram. Now, Milgram could have protected himself from this problem by early on entering into an agreement with the hotel owners that they would look only to the principal and not to Milgram as the agent in the event of a breach by the principal. The hotel owners, who collectively were the third party in the Stanford case, decided that they would bring suit against S. William Stanford. And because Stanford was a partially disclosed principal, their efforts were successful, despite Stanford's attempts to conceal his identity. The problem of identifying the principal turned out to not be much of a problem at all. It seems that when the hotel owners threatened Gary Milgram, the agent, with a potential lawsuit for $10 million, he quickly identified the principal. As we've just seen, liability in an agency relationship is greatly affected by whether the principal is disclosed, undisclosed, or partially disclosed. A second area of agency liability arises from wrongs or torts an agent may commit and the losses resulting from those torts. In the course of their business dealings, agents often come into close contact with the general public. There are cases where agents behave in ways that cause injury or harm to the public. So a key question is, who is liable for that injury? It's clear that if the agent commits a tort or crime that harms a third person, the agent should be held liable for that act. But in certain situations, principals become liable for the torts of their agents under what's known as the theory of respondeat superior. Respondeat superior literally translated means let the master answer, which means that the principal 
is responsible for the torts of the agent that are committed in the scope of employment and according to the agent's instruction or scope of duty. The doctrine of respondeat superior is restricted, number one, to those types of agency relationships that are master-servant agency relationships. So first of all, we have to um, prove that the agent who committed a tort is a servant of a particular master. And this basically goes back to the idea of degree of control, that the master or the principal is telling the agent when to work, what to do, supervises the working hours, as opposed to an independent contractor relationship. For example, if you have an accountant who works in your firm and reports from 9 to 5 daily, you have a master-servant relationship. If you hire a CPA firm to do an audit, you've hired an accountant, but you've hired an independent contractor. And it's the degree of control that results in the liability because you know where these servants are and what they're doing, and that's why you can be held liable for them. The second requirement is that whatever it is that the agent has done or the servant has done was in the scope of employment. If they're out doing deliveries for you, even though they're not in the office, that's in the scope of employment. Very often when when employees are traveling and they're doing business in other states, they're certainly not anywhere near the office, but they're clearly within their scope of employment. So even accidents that they have there would also be covered. And it's a very logical theory because the agent who is out driving the florist delivery truck probably does not have sufficient insurance or money to pay in the event of an accident, whereas the owner of the business will. Why is this information about agency law so important? What significance is it to you? Well, let's assume when you finish college that you open up a small business and you're very successful and you hire your first employee. And that employee is authorized by you to drive the only piece of equipment you've got, the company truck. It's Friday. You paid this employee in cash. You didn't know that this employee had a drinking problem. In fact, the employee has had four prior DWIs, and that Friday afternoon, after having several beers, the employee drives along at a high rate, comes to a T intersection, doesn't stop, runs right into an SUV, and inside that SUV is a mom and an eight-year-old little girl. And because of the collision with your employee, the little girl is put in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. So... Who's got enough money to pay for her physical therapy and her hospital bills? Your employee? The drunk? The deadbeat? Oh, of course not. And you? What money do you have? Well, you borrowed everything you could to open up the business. But you are the one that's going to be sued because you didn't check out the fact that your prospective employee had four prior DWIs. So. When an employee is carrying out your responsibilities within the scope of employment, like driving a company truck to make a delivery, you are financially responsible. How can you limit your liability? First and foremost, you look at the employee and say, don't drink while you're at work, don't smoke marijuana or use drugs while you're at work, don't speed, and don't do any criminal acts. Now, not only should you tell this person, but you ought to write this down in just one page in simple, simple language. If your employee speaks another language, make sure it's both in English and the other language. Have that employee sign it. The employee gets a copy, and you get a copy to retain. So what's the significance of that document? Well, if you're being sued and you're facing a lawsuit in court and you want to show something to the jury, you have evidence to show to each member of the jury that, in fact, you told your employee not to do any intentional acts or negligent acts while they're at work that would cause you to be liable. In other words, the employee wasn't to drink wasn't to use uh, marijuana or drugs, wasn't to violate the laws. And therefore, the employee was outside the scope of their employment, and you don't have to pay when your employee is on a personal frolic. That's the importance to you for knowing about agency law.